reversing the worst evil. And at the beginning of this health crisis, which we are currently going through, I started studying more and more into the health message and even completed a medical missionary training course just to get more knowledge and more methods in how I could be a blessing to help others. And as studying the past in regards to uh, the giving of this health message to our church, I realized that what took place in the past with the separation of the health and the ministerial work has never been truly united as God intended it to be. And we're going to look at some of that history and we're going to come down into current events. But this might have been your situation when you come to join God's Remnant Church. You might have been given an Amazing Facts study guide and learned about the clean and the unclean foods. So we have to stay away, of course, from shrimp, lobsters, clams, and of course from alcohol and cigarettes. And that primarily might be it. You might not have been taught the eight laws of health. Um, you might not, mostly were not stressed to read the book Ministry of Healing. Um, we know about great controversy and desire of ages, which is a must, especially the Conflict of the Ages series, those five books is a must. But some of us has never really gotten into the health books and such as Ministry of Healing and for some churches, you only hear about health if it's a health and temperance day. That may be the only sermon of the 52 Sabbath sermons in the year that you hear about health. Or a medical missionary during that Sabbath quoting from Ministry of Healing, whereby you go and have a desire to learn more about health. And I believe because of what took place in the past, why many ministers do not touch on this topic and many other topics has a reason being as what took place in the past. And it primarily has to do with starting with um, John Harvey Kellogg. So I'm going to go into a little bit of the history of what took place and why things are as they are and how we can help to join these two work together in which God said they should be joined. John Harvey Kellogg, very brilliant man who God blessed with much wisdom and knowledge and his training made him the most highly educated man in the church. Now in 1888, we may be aware of the 1888 meetings in Minneapolis, it is written about him. After the meeting at Minneapolis, Dr. Kellogg was a converted man and we all knew it. We could see the converting power of God working in his heart and life. And the Holy Spirit working through him, he led out having orphan, raising up in orphanages and also helping bands and the medical missionary work was growing and growing and many souls were being saved from sin and restored to health. But in general conference, the general conference meeting in 1891, as we look at this history, which took place, Elder James White Starry wrote in 1870, speaking about with the health message. As a people, we have discarded the use of tobacco in all its forms. Thank God for so glorious a victory over our perverted appetite. In the annual assemblies of the leading men of our denomination, not the least taint of the filthy weed can be discovered by smell or sight. Our people have discontinued the use of tea and coffee as unnecessary, expensive, and injurious to health. Here another victory has been gained. Elder James White wrote in 1870. 
Then it says, but the, but the reform does not stop here. Our people have put away the use of swine's flesh and to a great extent of flesh meats generally. This they have done from a conviction that flesh is not the most nutritious or the most healthful food for man. While flesh meats stimulate, they do not build up the system as other foods do. This was once an experiment with our people, now it is demonstrated. So praise God, we, the health message came, the vision to Ellen White in 1863, that's seven years later in 1870, and much changes has been taking place in the church in 1870. We read about the tobacco, swine's flesh, and the meat eating, flesh meats. Now this is what was taking place in the 1870s. Our ministers preach hygiene reform and live it wherever they go. And our many publications carry it to the doors of all our people. Thousands have testified to the benefits of the changes they have made. They report better health and an increase of physical strength. So God's church was embracing the message and we were sharing the message and preaching hygiene reform and the ministers were living it wherever they go. Now it says here, unfortunately, the good work of reform had by the end of another decade, that's now 1880, not only ceased its onward progress, but there had been a very marked retrograde. Other issues coming before the people had attracted their attention, and the promulgation of health principles had ceased to receive the influence necessary to keep them before the people. So other topics are being preached, and now the health message is not being proclaimed as it should. So it's going over now what was taking place. Large number of young ministers had entered the field as preachers who had never received adequate instruction in health principles and who consequently were not prepared either to appreciate their principles and to teach others. So what started to take place? It says, in consequence, a great backsliding had begun and progressed to an extent that which was not fully comprehended until the Tetal Pledge. They had this pledge in 1879 and they were asking the people and they found out that hundreds among us were addicted to the habitual use of tea and coffee and that it could no longer be said not the least taint of filthy weed would be discovered among us as a people. So then John Harvey Kellogg started to speak about what was taking place in our church and he gave this, this speech here in 1891 at the general conference of what was actually happening. And he states, the good beef steak was necessary for good health. This is what some people were saying, that good cheese was essential to good digestion and a cup of strong tea now and then to relieve headache, not particularly objectionable and possibly of service as a pre preventative. So here, total backsliding is taking place and now they are doing, putting in their bodies things that they should not. And he spoke about what was happening at camp meetings. He said that there was a good supply of lard crackers, dried beef, smoked halibut, codfish, smoked herring, and a good supply of ripe cheese, and sundry coils of sausage. And people were drinking tea and coffee. So now, John Harvey Kellogg brings out at this general conference here back in 1891 what was taking place among us as a people, how we were backsliding from the health message and how we need to follow the health message which God has given to us as a people so that we can be in health and be a blessing to God's people. So then 
in 1893, which is two years later, later at the next general conference session, we're going to see what happened then because a change took place and what they did because people were not happy what John Harvey Kellogg had to say back in that general conference and, and Dr. James, John Harvey Kellogg was to give eight messages. Now, when he gave his messages, the ministers and some of the people did not like what they heard back in 1891 at that general conference session. So here's what took place. It says that after he gave it, and usually this discourse would be sent out to the members so that they could all read it in the general conference daily bulletin. Here's what happened. It says that the funds raised for the publication of the bulletin having been exhausted, the publication of the report of the meetings and other matters pertaining to medical missionary and benevolent work was undertaken by the medical missionary. So what happened is all of those messages was not distributed and sent out to the people. They say there was not funds. And here is a, a more plausible assessment is that people remembered what John Harvey Kellogg said in the last general conference session in 1891 about the lard crackers and the lively cheese, cheese comments. And they made an editorial decision that would make all of Kellogg's talks to entirely disappear from the official record. So these blessed talks by John Harvey Kellogg in 1893, people, unless they were there, they didn't get access to it by an editorial decision. So here we are seeing, first the health message is going, it's multiplying, people are making changes, then they started to backslide. John Harvey Kellogg points out, even among the ministers, what was taking place in the camp meetings, and then the ministers are not happy with John Harvey Kellogg bringing these points out. And then it gets even worse because the general conference presidents in the general conference president back in 1888 was President G.I. Butler. And he had something to say in regards to John Harvey Kellogg. And Ellen White wrote G.I. Butler a letter. And this is what Ellen White had to say to G.I. Butler. Because remember, conference president is G.I. Butler. John Harvey Kellogg is teaching a health message. And there is this spirit taking place. So here's what the prophet says. It will be seen sometime that our brethren and sisters have not been inspired by the spirit of Christ in the manner of dealing with Dr. Kellogg. Your attitude toward him will not bear the approval of God. Even if he was the man which you think him to be, you cannot be any help to him while you maintain this position. But you can pursue a course that will so weaken his confidence in his brethren that they cannot help him and where he needs to be helped. She says he has signaled, signalized himself as a man of wisdom and aptitude to plan and execute them. And his high standing in the medical profession has an influence to remove from a large class the false impressions which have prevailed with regard to Seventh-day Adventists being an ignorant class of people. Because John Harvey Kellogg was the most known doctor at that time period in the 1800s. And because John Harvey Kellogg was a Seventh-day Adventist, this removed some of the stigma against the church, as it says here being an ignorant class of people because we have John Harvey Kellogg as being a Seventh-day Adventist who is so intelligent and the work in which we are doing. She says, there is no reason why his brethren should stand away from him and criticize and denounce him 
when they have no real knowledge of his work and what they are talking about. They gather from hearing or supposition the idea that Dr. Kellogg is a designing dangerous man. And acting upon that idea, they unjustly and with an unchristian spirit place themselves directly in the way of his efforts, thus counteracting the good work he is trying to do. And their course is not fair and just. It may produce a condition of things to drive him to the very things they condemn. The opposition that has existed in reference to Dr. Kellogg is contagious and is hostile to the health of the soul. This is not the spirit of Christ and will have no saving influence upon Dr. Kellogg. So strong words there from the prophet to conference president G.I. Butler because many were following G.I. Butler and this sentiment against Dr. Kellogg was growing and the prophet of God is speaking against that. Then she says, if the doctor fails in doing his duty and being an overcomer at last, those brethren who have failed in their want of wisdom and discernment to help the man when and where he needed their help will be in a large measure responsible. For there have been but few who have faithfully warned him in kindness and love for his soul, but hurt him with their thrusts behind his back. And we know later on that because of this pressure, he decided to do the work by himself to separate himself from the conference. Later on, he's disfellowshipped, and then he writes the book Living Temple, and then Review and Herald burns down, and then Ellen White was constantly appealing to him, but he had went astray. And the prophet says that those brethren who have failed in their want of wisdom and discernment to help the man will be in a large degree responsible for his loss of his salvation because of what they were doing to him. Has not Dr. Kellogg shown the greatest respect to our ministers? Has he ever given the least evidence that he was ashamed of our brethren? I hope, my brother, that you will no longer cherish such thoughts. They are unworthy of a Christian. So as we look at this history now, we see the separation took place and we see the counsel given from the prophet and we see who are the people to blame if he does go astray. And then Ellen White also wrote in Manuscript Releases, Volume 4, page 372, Why do some of our ministers manifest so little interest in health reform? At this time, some of them would not attend the meetings where health reform was presented. presented. These men became its bitterest enemies. They, were, they became so opposed to it, they were displeased with those who gave it their attention and presented it to the people. Thus, those who have should have been the first to advocate the principles of health reform in every line of their work by precept and example show that they were not in harmony with it. These men, she says, were not making progress in divine things that would make them safe teachers. They were opposed to health reform because why? Instruction on temperance in all things was opposed to their practice of self-indulgence because of sin. This was the great stumbling block in the way of bringing our people bringing the way of bringing the people to investigate and practice the truth in regards to health reform. So now here comes the opposition. It is a fact that our ministers are very slow to become health reformers. Notwithstanding all the light the Lord has given upon this subject. Now because of that, she says this has caused Dr. Kellogg to lose confidence in them. 
their tardy work in health reform has created in him a spirit of criticism, and he has borne down on them in an unsparing manner, which the Lord does not sanction. So because of that, what John Harvey Kellogg did, he has belittled the gospel ministry and in his regard and ideas has placed the medical missionary work above the ministry. I have seen that in the censuring of ministers' remarks have been made which have not been to the honor and glory of God. So this is all the controversy that was taking place in the 1890s in regards to the ministry, the medical missionary work, the ministers, and the health message. It says here, once again, the manuscript release, volume 21. Some have looked upon the medical missionary work with suspicion because of its constantly increasing success. Unless these are baptized with the Holy Spirit, they will continue to entertain their jealous feelings, whatever power God may reveal in advancing the truth. They will lose the spiritual blessings they might have had and will bring the divine judgments upon themselves. So here we see even jealousy was taking place because those who were doing the true medical missionary work were spreading the gospel and many were converted and joining the church. And it says that some were looking upon those who were doing the medical missionary work and having jealousy because these medical missionaries were getting more converts than those who were just preaching the message and separating the health work. And she says that jealousy was setting in amongst those individuals. So it, all of this leads to why we are in the condition that we are in. Instead of having sanitariums everywhere, what do we have? Hospitals everywhere giving drug medications when we were taught to stay away from drugs and to do simple treatments to help people to reverse disease with the eighth law of health. All this stems from what took place in the 1800s, 1900s in regards to the medical missionary work. And this statement here is found in General Conference Bulletin 1903. And Ellen White speaks about the treatment here that Kellogg received. She says, God does not endorse the efforts put forth by different ones to make the work of Dr. Kellogg as hard as possible. In order to build themselves up, God gave the light on health reform, and those who rejected it, rejected God. Once again, God gave the light on health reform, and those who rejected it, rejected God. Those ministers who were rejecting the health message, many of them because they disliked Don, John Harvey Kellogg, they were rejecting God because the message of health reform came from God. One and another who knew better said that it all came from Dr. Kellogg and they made war upon him. This had a bad influence on the doctor. He put on the coat of irritation and retaliation. God did not want him to stand in the position of warfare and he does not want you to stand there. So that history, which we just looked at there with John Harvey Kellogg, stems into, has reaching effects unto us in these last days, especially why many of us, God's people, are dying from the same diseases that the world is suffering from because the ministerial and the medical missionary work is not united because most ministers do not teach on health and the mission, medical missionaries, their work is pretty much over here by themselves. Now, what does this have to do with us in these last days? It has much to do with us because as we see, we are entering into or are already in the little time of trouble. We see persecution coming on all sides because Rome 
has attacked the whole world with this health crisis. This is what the prophet says for us in these last days. She says, among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, which is us, meat eating will eventually be done away with. Flesh will cease to form a part of their diets. We should ever keep this end in view and endeavor to work steadily toward it. Councils on Diets and Food, page 380. So those of us waiting for the coming of the Lord, she said, meat eating will eventually be done away with. But if we are not studying the laws of health and no one is preaching this to us and we are ignorant of this fact, how will we be ready for the coming of the Lord? Councils and Diets and Foods, page 380. She says, vegetables, fruits, and grains should compose our diet. Not an ounce of flesh meat should enter our stomachs. The eating of flesh is unnatural. We are to return to God's original purpose in the creation of man. And one last statement here in Councils and Diets and Foods, 382 paragraph 1, she says, Greater reforms should be seen among the people who claim to be looking for the soon appearing of Christ. Health reform is to do among our people a work it has not yet done. There are those who ought to be awake to the danger of meat eating, who are still eating the flesh of animals, thus endangering the physical, mental, and spiritual health. Many who are now only half converted on the question of meat eating will go from among God's people to walk no more with them. Council and Diets and Foods, page 382. So, those who are only now half converted on a question of meat eating will go from God's people to walk no longer with them. In this shaking time period, the shaking and the sifting, especially when the mark of the beast crisis breaks upon us, these people will go from God's people to walk no more with them because they have not gotten the victory. God has provided an abundance of fruits and grains which may be healthfully prepared and used in proper quantities. Why then do men continue to choose flesh meats? Can we possibly have confidence in ministers who at tables where flesh is served join with others in eating it? Council of Diets and Foods, page 401. So here she asks, can we have confidence in ministers who are eating flesh meats? Because we are in this health crisis now and rather than we, have shown the whole world how they can stay healthy by obeying the laws of health and teaching people the message which God has given us. What has the leadership done? They do whatever the CDC says, which is in contrary to God's methods of health. But when you look in the Bible now, in the Great Commission, we know that's found in Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus gave us the great commission and said, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The great commission which God has given to us. We are to give the everlasting gospel, the three angels' messages, to the whole world. But as you know, when you study the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what is said in one is also said in another book, but may give a little more detail. Now, when we look about the Great Commission in Mark, Mark says in Mark 16, verse 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 18, we're going to jump down. Mark 16, verse 18. They shall take up serpents, 
and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So here in Mark, as he's speaking about the Great Commission, saying that God's people, as they're preaching the gospel, they should also lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And this can be looked at twofold, laying hands on the sick. We could lay hands on individuals who are sick and pray for them. And also we can lay hands on the sick and do simple natural remedies to alleviate the sicknesses that the people have. So we see when the Gospel Commission, as it says here in Mark, we are so all supposed to also lay hands upon the sick because we're supposed to do a work as Jesus did and Jesus is the great physician and he did more healing than preaching. Now let's look out in the Bible when Jesus sends out the disciples because we are also Jesus' disciples and when Jesus sends out the disciples in Matthew chapter 10 verse 1 the Bible says, and when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sicknesses, sickness and all manner of disease. Matthew 10 verse 8, the Bible says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. So the Holy Spirit would come upon the disciples and they would do a work as Jesus did. As he sent them out, he told them to heal the sick. And the health message which God has given to us is we are also to bring healing to the world and also do the same work. Now in Mark chapter 3 verse 14, And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach. Verse 15, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. So Matthew says it, Mark says it. Now let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 9 verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. So here Luke says, Luke the physician says, they were given power to cure diseases. What will the doctors tell you? Well, this is a lifelong chronic disease that you have. There is no cure. You'll have to take this, have this sickness for your whole life, this disease, and just take these pills for the rest of your life. But the Bible says that God gave his disciples power and authority to cure diseases. God is able, God will do it, when his people follow his methods. Luke 9 verse 2, and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Luke 9 verse 2. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see the same thing. Heal the sick. Heal sicknesses and heal diseases. Now, Jesus also sent out the 70. That's found in Luke chapter 10. These 70 disciples, Jesus appointed 70 and sent them out two by two. And in Luke 10 verse 1 it says, And these things the Lord appointed other 70 also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Drop down to verse 9. And heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. So even the 70, God told the 70 also, heal the sick. Because as we are in this health crisis, there are sickness all around us. People are sick and now is the prime opportunity when people will think about health. So now is the prime opportunity for us to share with others the eight laws of health teach them how that they can be healthy, have strong immune systems, and how God's ways are. And as we use the right arm of the gospel, which is the health message, the door will be open for us to give them 
the everlasting gospel so that they can come to Christ, surrender to Christ, and be born again Christians. But when we do not use the right arm of the gospel, the health message, our work is much harder because now most people have a lot of emotional stress, physical diseases. A lot of people are in such a trap by what they listen to that Satan has a stronghold upon their minds. And nine tenths of all disease begin in the mind. So therefore, since we have to clear up their minds, we need to use the health message so that the frontal lobe can work properly so that they can accept Bible truth. Now, as we go back to the time in which we are living now in the last days, in early writings, page 67, paragraph two, listen what Ellen White has to say, early writings. Some of us have had time to get the truth and to advance step by step. And every step we have taken has given us strength to take the next, the ladder of sanctification. Then she says, but now time is almost finished and what we have been years learning, they will have to learn in a few months. They will also have much to unlearn and to learn again. Those who will not receive the mark of the beast and his image when the decree goes forth must have decision now to say nay, we will not regard the institution of the beast. So in this statement she says, in, they will have much to learn in a few months. And also we're told the final events will be rapid one. Look how rapidly this world has changed when you look at what has taken place in 2020 into 2021. So quickly the government has taken over the whole world and some of the even regular citizens are being treated as prisoners, especially in Australia and other countries, we see this tyranny taking place, medical tyranny. So quickly, things change. Final events, rapid ones. So she says much will have to unlearn and to learn. So therefore, I believe in the context in which we're living because we have here this health crisis, much to unlearn and much to learn has to do with our embracing truly now of what the health message is and to use the health message when we are giving the three angels messages because they are intertwined together. So we will have to unlearn the wrong methods of evangelism which we were doing and to learn the correct methods of evangelism which is found Primarily, when you go through the book Councils and Diets and Foods, all those chapters speaking about the third angel's message and the right arm, how it opens doors, it opens the heart so that the message can come in. We'll have to unlearn the wrong ways, learn the right methods, and to use them. And in a few short months, has to do with also the medical missionary work. Because when the latter rain is poured out upon God's people, just as what took place in the early rain, we're going to do healing. We'll be healing the sick. But now we also have to be healing. But the reason why we are told that the miraculous healings that was you see in the scriptures is not happening right now because Satan will counterfeit the miracles of healing. And also because so people are so dead in trespasses and sins, the more time we have to spend to bring about healing, there's the more time we can use with an individual to get all of Satan's attack on the mind and have the Holy Spirit work with them. It takes time for that sanctification process to take place, especially people who are dead in trespasses and sins. So therefore, the medical missionary work as it's being done now, it takes time working with people. And by that time, you can teach them about the gospel, teach them about Jesus, to go with them through the scriptures and teach them how they can have health. So that's what I truly believe is these few short months. They will have to learn in a few short months 
the right method which God had given us at the beginning, which has been mostly cast to the wayside, and we will have to do the work the correct way so that we can save people and give that warning message now. And the books which God has given to us in regards to the health message, the primary book is the book Ministry of Healing. This book every Seventh day Adventist needs to read, especially now, the Ministry of Healing, chapters on minister to the sick, minister to the poor, how we can do this work effectively. And the first chapters deal with how Jesus healed disease and shown the connection between physical healing and spiritual condition, how Jesus did that dual work. So we have that book. Then there's also this book called The Soul Soul, which I was reading about John Harvey Kellogg, which is excellent. It goes through the whole history, but there's only a few left, and Amazon has them used copies. So these are the type of books when you want to study more about the health message, and we should all have the Natural Remedies Encyclopedia. This is a resource which every home should have because it teaches the laws of health, it shows how thousands of diseases can be treated with natural remedies, and it also teaches physiology and anatomy, so we can learn much just going through the encyclopedia with all those pages. We can learn and we can also help people. Oh, you have this problem, well, here's a way that you can get healing from that, here's a natural way, and also present Christ to individuals. Then there is also the Medical Missionary Manual by Harvest Time Books, and all of these books, they are there. There are videos online. There's really no excuse for us in a health crisis not learning how better we can be a blessing to others in regards to teaching people how to have a strong immune system. Now, regarding the title of this message, reversing the worst evil, there is a statement found by in the Spirit of Prophecy by Ellen White, manuscript page 46, 1904. She says, My brethren, the Lord calls for unity for oneness. We are to be one in the faith. I want to tell you that when gospel ministers and medical missionary workers are not united, there is placed on the churches on our churches, the worst evil that can be placed there. The worst evil that can be placed there is when gospel ministers and medical missionary workers are not united. One does their thing and the other doesn't want to hear it, just does their own thing. And when this unity does not exist, we are not following Jesus' example, who is our Lord and Savior, who said, we need to join this work together. And when you go and look at the loud cry, because many sheep are not of this fold, in Revelation chapter 18, we know when the loud cry message goes to the whole world, Revelation 18 verse 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And we are calling people out of Babylon so that they do not receive her plagues. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18 verse 4. That loud cry message from the latter rain swelling to a loud cry, there is actually even there a connection with medical missionary work. Because in medical Ministry, page 317, paragraph 3, it says, We shall see medical missionary work broadening and deepening at every point of its progress because of the inflowing of hundreds and thousands of streams until the whole earth is covered as the waters cover the sea, just as we see there in Revelation 18, verse 1. And this is why Satan, is, it says in the Spirit of Prophecy, is coming as to counterfeit as a great medical missionary. Why is he counterfeiting and coming as a great medical missionary? Because he knows that God's people are going to be doing the true medical missionary work 
and he is going to personate Christ and coming as a counterfeit doing healings. False healings is what Satan is going to be doing because God's people is going to be doing the true healings filled with the Holy Spirit. So for us to be getting, be involved of getting the latter rain and doing this type of work, even now we should be doing the work which God has called us to do in our sphere of influence, helping others in regards to this health crisis. Because we cannot have all of this truth and this taking place and we just sit idly by and think that the Lord will be pleased with us. And just some statements here, she says, Ellen White says, Let our ministers who have gained experience in preaching the word learn how to give simple treatments and then labor intelligently as medical missionary evangelists. All gospel workers should know how to give simple treatments that do so much to relieve pain and remove disease. So here she's saying all gospel workers. That's all of us. All gospel workers should know, she says, how to give simple treatments. Then she talks about the canvasser who goes house to house. As the canvasser goes from place to place, he will find many who are sick. He should have a practical knowledge of the cause of disease and should understand how to give simple treatments that he may relieve the suffering ones. And last, God's people are to be genuine medical missionaries. They are to learn to minister to the needs of soul and body. They should know how to give simple treatments that do so much to relieve pain and remove disease. Because we see Big Pharma is a monster and what they are doing to people, they are not helping people to get victory over diseases. It's us a money-making system. If our ministers would work earnestly to obtain an education in medical missionary lines, she says they would be far better fitted to do the work of Christ, do work, to do the work Christ did as a medical missionary. By diligent study and practice, they can become so well acquainted with the principles of health reform that wherever they go, they will be a great blessing to the people they meet. So, we looked at the history, we see what took place with Kellogg, we saw the split there, and we see even now, joining the church, you get bare minimum in regards to health, just unclean foods primarily, and stay away from caffeine and coffee, and it's just bare scratching the surface of what the health message is. And then we go out doing evangelism without using the right arm and we would have much better effects if we do this work. And we know that the laymen will finish the work. So we need not wait on leadership because they have gone joining with the world. We individually, every one of us are called to be medical missionaries. We can do our part to help people who are suffering and to introduce them to Jesus Christ. All of the tools we need found in, in the spirit of prophecy, there are videos, there are medical missionaries, there are things that we can do. Because this is very serious, because a time is coming whereby you cannot buy or sell. So if you have not learned about the health message and you yourself are sick, and then if you yourself are on all these prescription drugs, my question is when you cannot buy or sell, how are you going to refill your prescriptions? So this is why those individuals who do not understand the health message and many of them who are just doing all just drugs, 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 when we cannot get the drugs, we have to know these people have to get off these things because if you cannot buy or sell, how are you going to get drug medications? How are you going to see the doctor? So we need to know how to take care of our own bodies so that what is coming in the future when you cannot buy or sell, we will know how to stay healthy 
and not lean upon doctors who just say, here, take this drug, here, take this drug, here, take this drug, when they know nothing about how to keep a person to prevent disease. They're all about just having disease running a rampant and just dealing with symptoms. So now is the time, brothers and sisters. Jesus is coming soon. Time is short and we need to unite this work, the medical missionary work and the gospel message so that this gospel can go to the whole world and Jesus can return. We are in a health crisis and God has given us the answers and there are protocols that we can follow if we know someone who has gotten this virus that they can do to recover. And God is so good and God will be with his people when they seek him first. So let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy truth. We thank thee for your love towards us. We thank thee that you have given us answers where people in this world are searching for answers. I pray that we, your people, will be obedient to the work you have given us to do so that we can help to alleviate all of the stress, the anxiety, and the emotional issues that many are going through because the government have placed individuals in these situations. Help us to point individuals to Jesus and help us give us the wisdom so that we can help others to get victory over the health problems that they have so that we can glorify you in our bodies. Be with us all in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>